Okay, good evening, everyone. We would like to begin, please. So uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the session Reconsiderations. My name is Flamit, and I will be the convener of this session. We are having with us today fascinating lectures and an honorable guest, Professor Leslie Irvin. Welcome, everybody. I will invite each lecturer according to the conference program. Each lecture will be up to 15 minutes, and I will inform you about the time after 13 minutes, so please pay attention. If you have any question or comment, you are more than welcome to write it down in the chat box. Please write the name of the lecture that your question is referred to. You can also wait and raise your hand when we get to the open discussion part. Okay, so please let's begin with our first speaker. Um, I would like to invite our first speaker, Anna Schneider. Anna belongs to the Friedrich Alexander University, Erlingen, Nuremberg, and she will talk to us about urbanizing pets or animaling the city, redefining the city as past human. Please. Thank you first for having me and um, thank you especially for the organizers to put, uh, for putting this wonderful conference together for all of us to discuss uh, human, non-human animal relationship from different perspectives. Now, today I'm going to talk about the question of urbanizing pets or animaling the city um, and um, redefining the city as post-human. Now, whilst the idea is getting challenged more and more, we still struggle to give up what Franklin calls um, the notion of cities as humanist citadels successfully designed against nature and constituting a purified world of humans amongst themselves. And at the same time, hyperseparation can no longer be seen as a solution for it is not the city which is changing, but merely the perception of it. In urban spaces, boundaries are created everywhere to ensure that what is seen as wild and uncontrollable stays out of human created safety zones, protecting a controllable city life above all else. Easily overlooked is that a city has actually never been limited to human habitat and that animals appearing in the urban landscape follows a long tradition based on co-evolutionary processes. To understand the correlation of contemporary human animal relations in the city, we do have to understand it as a consequence of an interwoven history of domestication. Urban spaces as purely human are no more than a myth that is overturned by the increasing attentiveness to the many animals that reside in our cities, some newly arrived and others predating the city itself, as the Rowan and Rose put it. Opposite to past assumptions about domestication being a single human intended process, recent research described it as a multi-stage model. Quite late in the axiomatic co-evolutionary process in what Seda describes as a third pathway to domestication, the directed pathway that humans start to actively domesticate animals by selecting them based on preferential traits. The result is the emergence of tame animals and pets. Domestication proceeded along a continuum from anthropophily to commensalism to control in the wild to control of captive animals to extensive breeding to intensive breeding and finally to pets. And the domestication process, however, is still ongoing. Even so recent evolutionary developments are rarely understood as such. Taking canines as an example, their relationship with humans continues to adapt to a new urban lifestyle. Now, by only a few decades ago, many of them still took the roles of working animals, working at farms, etc., or at least guarding the house. Their primary function in the city today is that of a companion. Furthermore, their social radius changed to accompany their human counterparts in everyday life to city strolls and restaurants, as well as sometimes even to work. In some cases, they even take on work themselves in the city functioning, for example, as all kinds of assistant dogs. Modern genetics allows for extensive control of animal breeding and reproduction, creating pure breaths designed to satisfy human preferences on the one hand, while at the same time neutering or even euthanizing unwanted examples with a less desirable family tree. And even a question about moral reasonings like overpopulation, et cetera, aside, this leaves us with a direct domesticating human interference in the form of genetic isolation and breeding. Entering the discussion about animals' places in human society, coming from a contradicting point of view, ignores the shared history and interdependence of humans and animals still actively upheld until today. Explanations for the need for animal companions include a number of theories. For example, shift as muscles need theories, animals serving as resources for communication and social addresses, self psychology or neurobiological approaches based on a social response system, like, for example, the human-animal relational theory. Companion animals gain the ability to transcend their own species and often gain the status of valued family members. The recognition as individual beings with different needs and characteristics in private places describes a development that can be transferred partly into public spaces later on. 
If you're looking at cities as multi-species places, pets and companions are, of course, not the only representatives of the animal world. Urban life as opposition to nature is still originally located in nature itself, and as such is by design home to more than humans. As such, we encounter a number of different species and different levels of human acceptance of them. There are those inside, mostly apart and limited of interacting with society, and those primarily located outside, creating their own living spaces alongside urban architecture. Now, it is in this context that even canines or felines, whose individual members had been previously ascribed as family members, change status and can become anomalies in need of correction and a question of urban management. The human categorization of the animal changes its perception and it brings with it even legal requirements of how to handle the individual animals. Going beyond simpler categorizations like ugly or cute, clean or dirty, female or male, the public space, kites and dogs are classified as the lost, the feral and the homeless. Their meaning, but also their rights change with the categorization as protective laws for pets, by their past and possible future association with a human may still cover the lost, the homeless and the feral are non-citizen, as Haraway would describe them, with very few emphasis and an uncertain future often closely tied to the urban city's urban planning and animal control strategies. Both factors frequently go along with the animal population status and the concerned urban area as overpopulation is a matter of public health, space, housing and finances. Now, having mentioned urban space as both as a home for private animals living behind the closed curtains of the human's home, as well as their more feral counterparts, there are those times when these categories blend. This issue mostly concerns canines and felines who can inhabit a large operating radius beyond the limitations of their home. While felines pursue this freedom on their own, taking on the identity of public animals for a chosen time, canines act under different regulations. Not the animal itself keeps the home, but the human and the dog by extension. Therefore, the dog is dependent on the human for sanctioned access to public space. And as an inseparable unity, sometimes even physically due to the connection of the leash, the relationship itself leaves the private space and it recreates the dog as a semi-public one animal. And now stepping into public areas with companion animals puts the characteristic of domestication as a spatial process in a new light. And it opens up the question of when, where, and how to include or exclude animal citizens. While in the past, dogs would be limited to stay behind and specifically, for example, guarded houses when their owners left and that by fulfilling their purpose. In contemporary society, the trend is to bring one's dog almost everywhere. Therefore, leashes and muscles become even more important as they enable the owners to expand the control of closed rooms, creating a kind of extended private space around the human. Through this, leashes and muscles highlight that animals have to abide by the rules of urban life as to be allowed to be part of it. This stems from often underlying discussion about decivilizing human spaces by sharing it with animal cohabitants. As Holmberg argues, there are four main concerns following this fear of decivilization. The matter of safety and risk, disturbance, excrements, and in the case of dogs, a certain dogginess. My dogs are domesticated animals are not doubted in private spaces. Their place in the public is a process of continuous negotiation. And this concerns the creation of particular spaces for dogs, like dog parks and beaches, or the regulations under which dogs are allowed to move in those and other spaces at all. These laws, size regulation, picking up experience are all reactions to reduce the negative impact on urban spaces and its inhabitants. Contact with animals is very structured following a strict exertion of control. It is less of an outward and far more of an inward struggle to learn to live with and accept non-human animals in urban spaces. And Amposter determines that our lack for tolerance for wildness, our drive to control is at the heart of our troubled relationship with the natural world. By we share space with nature on many levels, as wildness is everywhere, they describe relationships we end up as companion animals, especially dogs, offer one way to bring humans closer to the idea of the more than human and the co produced environment. Because of their obvious domesticated characteristics, they represent the bridge between nature and culture and the first step to accept wildness into the city. And to start with the questioning of overcoming the boundedness of the city, the more material dimensions of place have to be emphasized. The city embodies not only a specific material place, but also a symbolic place, whereas the first is associated with the reality of being and potential of becoming home to animal others. The second is essentially antagonistic to the idea of what is considered wild, and it represents dimension hyper-separation. 
It is, however, this symbolism which has to be adapted to bring about a change in human animal cohabitation. Humans have to accept urban space, not as a civilizing struggle against wildness, but as a hybrid space containing both humans and non-humans. Companion animals share the struggle of wildlife in the city and especially semi-public animals like dogs are taking part in everyday urban life on many levels while still often being perceived as a stranger or an other. Even individual dog owners are influenced by the change of space as in treating their companion differently at home than in the public environment, transferring social inhibitions and expected behavior onto their animal companions. And society's expectations towards their four-legged neighbors are quite clear. Animals should not be disruptive and disappear in the background of spaces occupied by humans. Now, the social rules of human computation are extended to the interspecies neighborhood. As mentioned before, tamed animals can transcend their species. However, this brings with it the demand to subject to human rules as well. While some wildlife is controlled to material boundaries like fences, the wildlife domesticating our homes becomes almost unrecognizable by the extent of control exercised on it. Other animal ethics ask us not to only consider the animal as a being worthy of moral consideration based on similarities, but to show respect for the differences of animals as others and, as our tool says, to address animals in their difference. It is therefore important to not just assimilate animals into urban life, but also respectfully integrate them according to their inherent nature. Now, during the creation of the image of the symbolic city as a space free of disrupting natural influences, nature has been stripped of all intrinsic value or meaning. It is that intrinsic value that we have to rediscover to create a co-emergent role based on intimate human, more than human relationships of responsibility and care. To take companion animals once more as an example, many different meanings and values have been ascribed to them. However, mostly focusing on the species transcending aspect. They can move, assist, delight, and encourage us, qualities made possible by a history of domestication and adaptation to human life and human needs. Yet these qualifications and the more these companions bring to our lives stem not from their learned similarity, but also from their otherness itself. On one hand, their companionship, especially these unconditionally experienced love and the absence of social judgment draws people to these animals and enables them to step in as therapist and emotional support when other help is insufficient. But on the other hand, even companion animals beside these attributes are unpredictable in their remaining animality. They remind us of our own human double nature and the uncontrollable characteristics of life we encounter every day. How then can a post-human urban environment be created which allows for agreeable multi-species cohabitation? First of all, it has to be accepted that city is and has always been a post-human. Frida is facing the challenges of modern city planning. However, this does not free us from considering strategies to recognize and respect this more equally in urban management. I argue that what has already been done in the private space for chosen companions making room has to be transferred into the public. Urban planning has to find a delicate balance between controlling and nurturing nature, simultaneously discarding and reinventing boundaries for the well-being of the city's multi-species inhabitants. And to realize this endeavor, public spaces have to be designed in a way that focuses not only on a human-centered perspective, but includes non-human animal interests as well. And for a change of urban spaces in the long term, a change in symbolism and meaning is most important. First steps being a rethinking Anna, of the excuse me, you, you have yeah. more two minutes more. Thank you. Sorry. Finish up. First things being a rethinking of city separation from the biophysical world and entering of a dialogue, including the dialectic of othering and connection with the animal side. And as companion animals already share our life and architectural structures, they are predetermined to become ambassadors of this change, bringing essential prerequisites to integrate them beyond their species boundaries. The challenge lies in still leaving room for their otherness. As such, the spaces we assign to them also serve as media, forming our relationship with the individuals, as well as the uncontrollable disruptiveness we fear in them. If you're looking at zoos, we can easily see how animal spaces influence and are used to influence the human perception of the animal. Um, returning to companion animals, this hyper-separation continues on expanding itself only to accept individual represents of the wild, but adhering to expectations of behavior and essentially forsaking their origin. It is the mark of domestication through the model of responsibility that allows semi-public animals and their owners to enter spaces if they govern their behavior. At the same time, encounters with wildness should challenge us, mark us, change us, and sometimes even at flesh. Um, and the co-creation of behavior has to go both ways. In this process, the responsibility you assume cannot simply be ignored as animals have become dependent and we return again to the necessity of a dialogue. Now, 
<laughs> when designing public spaces, there should be room for new urban symbolism of negotiating between human and animal spaces and breaching conventional boundaries. And building onto Butler's theory of performed identity, in Son and Sweeney's concept of animaling the city understands the cohabitation as doing and a spatially influenced process in which bodies are performed in particular times and places. Multi-species cities present a challenge and are characterized as disruptive. Despite this, reclaim, uh, reclaiming space and communicating differently about animals informs and can shape the way of thinking and experiencing animals. Now, while the post-human city will continue to include boundaries and divides, this otherness does not have to be hidden or kept secret, but may be embraced as an opportunity and a challenge to revisit our own identity and to relieve us from the burden of clinically separating humans and others. This brings me to the end of my presentation with a short overview of my sources, and I would like to thank you all for your attention and share my contact information with you in case any of you would like to reach out later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for a wonderful talk. Uh, let's move, please, to our next speaker, Cosetta Veronese. Cosetta is affiliated, is affiliated with Scuola de Interazione Humo Animale and International Society of Zoo Anthropology. Cosetta's lecture deals with philosophical considerations upon the nature and expressions of animal desire. Cosetta, please. Uh, no, no. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can, can you see. see my screen? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. I would also like to join in thanking uh, you for uh, the opportunity you have given me to take part in this wonderful conference. And I would like to start with my first live. Uh, the heart is a matter is uh, how Mark Beckett uh, calls a section in the first chapter of his uh, The Emotional Lives of Animals, a work in which he analyzes emotions as one of the elements of continuity between humans and non-humans. And it provides manifold examples of animals displaying human emotions. We have seen some yesterday. I mean, he quotes many from baby shims to um, elephants, uh, even a group of magpies performing a kind of funeral ritual. Now, um, he plays here on the English expression, of course, the heart of the matter. And uh, by changing it into the heart is a matter, actually Beckhoff uh, uses an expression which has wide ranging implications because it not only draws on the metaphor of the heart, as the traditional place for emotions and feelings, but also he suggests that matter has a heart, namely that matter thinks and feels. And uh, in the minutes at my disposal, I would like to investigate the um, origins of the idea of feeling and thinking matter in one of Italy's greatest 19th century poet thinkers, Giacomo Leopardi, and in particular focus on what he baptizes in his notebook, his theory of pleasure, and examine the core idea underpinning it, which is desire. And I would also like to see, um, briefly uh, describe, how all these elements actually resonate, echo, and feed back, I would say, in the uh, sciences of theology and zooanthropology, especially the, the zooanthropology, which has been configured and redefined by Roberto Marchesini, uh, an Italian philosopher, ethologist, and founder of the School for Human-Animal Interaction, and the idea behind the international, the, the basically the mind behind the idea of the International Society of Zooanthropology, which I here represent. So I would like to start with a quotation from Leopardi's notebook, the Zibaldone, which was written between 1819 uh, and 1827, and which reads as follows, that matter thinks is a fact. It's a fact because we ourselves think. It's a fact because we see that the modifications of thought depend entirely upon sensations, upon our physical state, and that our mind fully corresponds to the changes and variations in our body. It's a fact because we feel our thought corporeally. 
Each of us can feel that thought is not in our arm or in our leg. Each of us feels that we think using a material part of ourselves, that is the brain, in the same way as we can feel that we see with our eyes and touch with our hands. Those who deny thought to matter are denying a fact, standing against the evidence, at the least are putting forward an extravagant paradox. Those who believe that matter does think are not only suggesting nothing strange, abstruse, obscure, but are suggesting something obvious, are suggesting what is dictated by nature. Now, for Lepardi, existence begins with our senses. That is, it begins by being meta, by having a body. Anything which exists, for Lepardi, perceives the world through the senses. And it is out of perceptions, feelings, and uh, emotions that, that thoughts are born. Uh, regardless of the fact that Lopati does not clarify how the shift from feeling to thinking happened, by arguing that uh, our mind fully corresponds to the changes and variations in our body, he actually suggests that body and mind, flesh and intellect, are inextricably interconnected and can only be separated by death. Uh, now, the ontological leap of Lopardi, by comparison to his predecessors, and especially Descartes, uh, derives from um, assuming that feeling, which uh, derives from being incarnated, from having a body, cannot be separated from thinking, and that anything corporeal, animals, humans, plants, feels and thinks. Now, it's with a simple syllogism, we are matter, we feel and think, matter feels and thinks, that Lopardi extends to non-human animals attributes which had for centuries, for nearly two millenniums, considered an exclusive prerogative of the human species. The cogito ergo sum for Lopardi applies not only to humans. And uh, Lopardi, um, these words, were written, there's an echo, I hear an echo. Can you hear that too? Yes, we can hear that. Um, I don't know what that is, now it's perfect. So I was saying that these words were written about, about 40 years ahead of Darwin. And so it's um, about 40 years, Lopardi is a real anticipator of Darwin and he rejects the idea of human autarchy, that is the idea that humans constitute a unicum in the history of the species on the assumption of the existence of a common denominator which unites us to the rest of the living world. Now, from an adaptive, adaptative and evolutionary viewpoint, the relationship between the body and the outside world is one of continuous input and output. We could argue that the body operates like a sponge. It absorbs, it elaborates and feeds back. Now, um, on, for this reason, body and environment mutually affect each other in a process which modifies both individuals and species, that is, which has both phylogenetic and ontogenetic repercussions. Uh, of course, from a phylogenetic viewpoint, the adaptation of the morphological, physiological, and also the behavioral characteristic of the species to that living environment is a matter of survival. But as we shall now see, this is also true when we come to look at the story, at the lives of individuals. And um, let's consider what the word survival actually means. Um, on a closer look, the word suggests something else rather than the negative, if not dramatic meaning that is usually attached to it. Because survival, the, the verb to survive, suggests an upward movement. It contains the uh, preposition supra in Latin, which means above. And therefore, it seems to suggest a life which goes beyond mere existence. Uh, survival, the word survival, in other words, is related to something extra, to something more, an excess or exuberance of life, which we may call desire. 
And desire, as I previously said, is one of the core constituents of Leopardi's theory of pleasure, from which I will now quote. The human soul, and likewise all living beings, always essentially desires and focuses solely, though in many different forms, on pleasure or happiness, which, if you think about it carefully, is the same thing. This desire and this tendency has no limits because it is inborn or born along with existence itself, and so cannot reach its end in this or that pleasure, which cannot be infinite, but will end only when life ends. So to be born for Lepardi means to be motivated by desire, and it is here that desire becomes key to survival. Um, it's, it is here indeed that the word survival in its traditional meaning uh, of living longer, which actually incorporates the essence of evolutionary thought, begins to acquire a new resonance. Because to say that animals are driven by survival means that they intrinsically own something which pushes them forward. Uh, they have inside them an urge or to look at the world outside as a field of opportunity to uh, jump into the world, to embrace its challenges. Survival is possible because there is a surplus capacity and excessive energy which needs to find a way out and be released. So desire is essential for survival. And if on the one hand, the word survival uh, means, has a temporal connotation, it means to live longer, to hold on to life, it uh, begins to acquire also a spatial meaning. It suggests that individuals are endowed with a capacity to get over, to overcome the problems, overcome, surpass the challenges and uh, uh, the difficulties and problems offered by the environment and by life. So ultimately, survival occupies a space between choices, um, uh, uh, the space of choices, the evaluation of risks and opportunities. That is, it implies the capability of facing costs in order to grab chances. And if you think about it, what do survival courses offer, after all, if not the opportunity of overcoming one's limits. And this connection between desire and survival is also seemingly an etymological one, in the sense that like um, survival, also desire is a word that suggests an upward movement because it contains the Latin word cedar, which means star. So it suggests like, like a, a projection, an aspiration towards the stars. Now, when it comes to desire, um, it can also be um, it can also be measured. That's what I argue uh, by referring to Roberto Marchesini's uh, manual on canon education, where he defines a formula which actually provides a measure of individual desire. It calculates the possibility that, given certain risks and opportunities, a particular dog will display a certain behavior. And uh, it calls this formula the evolutionary differential. We, and the evolutionary differential actually assesses to what extent the power of motivation is braked uh, by the calculation of risk. With that, you have two minutes left. And even though, thank you, and even though it is a formula which was conceived for uh, dogs, it, uh, in my view, can apply equally well to humans. Now, motivation and desire go hand in hand, pushing the subject towards the world. They make him plunge into the world. Now, um, it is uh, here, uh, in this new, um, say, um, in all the facets that the word desire require in, uh, um, that I have tried to present here, um, the word desire um, acquires a new connotation. And this new connotation has been extensively explored in the work of Roberto Marchesini, but especially in uh, um, his latest, really freshly published book, the Roots of Desire, 
where he describes how desire, uh, where he frees desire from any moralistic connotation and it transforms it from a constraining and limiting force into an empowering force that is the capacity, the drive to overcome one's own limits. Now, um, it is true that animals, emotions and desires certainly extend to horizons uh, which are not completely known to us. Uh, while I feel confident that elephants feel some emotions that we do not and vice versa, I also believe that we experience many emotions in common. These are the words by Joyce Poole quoted by Mark Becker. Now, um, I think we all agree here that to question the existence of animal emotions and desire and to um, dismiss them as instinct uh, because uh, um, of uh, animals assumed lack of self-consciousness or even worse, to deny the existence of animal emotions and desire is means at this um, stage to be uh, scientifically reactionary. I would like to uh, remind, uh, remember the words of Patricia McCormack, who in commenting uh, Deleuze as a reader of Guattari says that encounters are not conditionally based on preconceived definitions of the other to which one comes, but an encounter with the other must be characterized by an openness because an encounter with a preconceived is a reification, a negation of the self and its freedom. So, uh, as uh, I suggested at the beginning, uh, if matter uh, thinks because matter has a body, then it comes as no surprise that in analyzing the feeling of compassion, which um, he considers rare in nature, even though not at all restricted to uh, humans, Giacomo Leopardi rem remembers, quotes, a dog that dropped bread from a balcony to another dog in the street. Now, animals do have a heart, and not just an anatomical one. Um, and 200 years after Leopardi, Mark Beckhoff, um, in his uh, second point of the Animal Manifesto, uh, reminds us that animal translates literally Leopardi words into English. He says that animals feel and think, and that animals have the cognitive and emotional capacities to make moral decisions and show kindness, compassion, and empathy. And um, is that it, that we really have to finish? Yes. Words, uh, last words. Last word is um, my, my wish here as a representative of the International Society of Zooanthropology that zooanthropology will provide um, by recognizing the contribution that the um, animal species have brought to the development of human culture, to the growth and birth and development of human culture will uh, eliminate any residues of uh, anthropocentric autarky. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cosetta, for a wonderful lecture. We're moving to our last speakers, Daphne Shir Verdesh from Achva College and Limor Chen from Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Their lecture will discuss vegans and other animals, renegotiating boundary, boundaries and hierarchies in multi species Israeli families. Daphne and Limor, please um, go ahead. So Limo and I will be presenting today a collaborative venture. Recent years have brought about a surging interest in multi-species bonds with researchers exploring entanglements between humans and their non-human counterparts in varying arenas and contexts. A group of five researchers, Dr. Anat Ben Yonatan, Dr. Oet Hirsch Matsuras, Professor Nir Avieli, Limo and myself, initiated a research project that probes the intersection between veganism and multi-species familial connections in the Israeli context. This presentation explores the incorporation of non-human animal into the everyday lives of Israelis and the re renegotiation of emotional attachments vegans form within their families and households. It delves into the ways ethical vegans as part of a social movement that rejects animal exploitation struggle to contend with the Israeli social constructions that place companion animals as inferior to humans, as well as emphasize the centrality of the human family. We examine the creative ways they contend with conflicts between their ideologies and emotions. Our methodology includes 23 interviews with vegan Israelis that have both human children and non-human animals. 
We interviewed people from various areas of Israel with ages ranging from 35 to 52. Some of the interviews took place in their homes and some on Zoom due to COVID-19 restrictions. Animals in the household included mostly cats and dogs, but also fish, hamsters, a chinchilla, and a rabbit. All were adopted or saved. Our findings are analyzed and compared to previous research on non-vegan multi-species families in Israel, as well as in other places. Specifically, we compare our data to my 2012 findings from my research on non-vegan non families in Israel. I concluded at the time that while companion animals are often considered as loved members of the family, when life changes occur, most often the birth of a human baby, these loving relationships are transformed or even terminated. I propose the term flexible personhood to denote the ways animals can be loved and incorporated into human lives, but also demoted and removed from the home and the family when circumstances change. Very soon after we began conducting our interviews, it became clear that there was much variation among the people we were talking to. We received diverging responses regarding the place of animals in their homes and the feelings that was felt towards these animals. What is more, interlocutors describe distinct relations with different animals in their home and even fluctuating relations with the same animals. It seems that vegans, perhaps more than non-vegans, are struggling to define the relationships with animals and the meanings these relations assume. Such was the case when they were asked to define the roles the non-human animals played in their homes and hearts. 19 of the 23 described their animals as family members, with eight of these explicitly addressing their animals as children or babies. As Tova said, they are like family members to us. They receive the best treatment we can give. As far as we are concerned, they are part of life. Following Daphne's previous conclusions, it might not be surprising that most interlocutors did not speak of their animals as their babies, and that those that did were hesitant about making unequivocal comparisons. They made a point of communicating differences between their animal and human babies, speaking of them as almost children, that are dependent in different ways than human babies, and that the emotions towards them are simpler and less strong. In general, Feelings of love and changing perceptions of animal worlds in the family were not significantly different than what was previously found in non-vegan families. At the same time, our interlocutors did introduce new terms when discussing their multi-species household and offered significantly diverse responses. Beyond the tendency to view the animals as family members, concepts regarding the place of the animals in the household were mixed. The people we spoke to categorized the animals as partners, siblings, even parents. They spoke of them as humans, individuals, subjects, personas, animal persons, entities they live with, and more. Most notably, they discussed the animals as defenseless creatures that need our human help and protection. In these parts of the conversation, notions of comparison, obligation, and responsibility emerge repeatedly. Compassion, or the conscious sympathy towards the other's distress and the desire to alleviate, it, to alleviate it, is an important aspect of vegan identity and activism. In fact, studies show they show vegans have higher empathy levels compared with non-vegans. Perhaps the most common slogan of vegan activists in Israel is justice, compassion, veganism. When we began our interviews, we asked our interviewees to describe their feelings towards their animals with emphasis on loving emotions. Surprisingly, some of our interlocutors felt uncomfortable describing their feelings as those of love and rather employed the use of the term compassion when del delineating their relationships with animals. Tova explains, for me, compassion is seeing a creature that needs help and not turning your back. There are also a lot of people that need help and I don't help them all at any given moment. But there is something about animals that I see as help. Somehow I view it differently than with people. I can't see it and ignore it. It seems that there is also a temporal difference between the two emotions. Compassion precedes love and can exist even when love cannot or does not. For Dina and Paz, for example, compassion is a generic emotion that is directed towards non-human animals or humans in distress, and there is no need for any previous contact or relationship. David agrees. 
Compassion is something that compels you to help someone that is in trouble. So if you help that someone, it doesn't mean that you have to love them or that they need to be your friend. Some of the interviewees differentiate between feelings of compassion, which were often expressed towards animals who are not viewed as members of the family, such as those kept outside of their homes, of their homes, farm animals or neglected animals on the street, whereas love or affection were more, more often expressed towards the animals in their family. Feelings of compassion were often closely related to a sense of obligation and responsibility. Actually, 18 of our interlocutors described this as a significant facet of their relationships with non-human animals. Other related notions they may mention were caring and concern. It seems that the empathy and identification our interlocutors feel concerning the animals affect the way they define these relations. They often describe how they, as humans, were responsible for the well being of animals. For this reason, when love and emotion towards the animals subsided, or even if they never existed, the animals were not given away and were still taken care of. Moreover, many of the people we spoke with stated that compassion and responsibility are what differentiate between vegans and non vegans, as David claims. Being vegan is being responsible for animals. Some people literally put animals in the street. That is something that a vegan would never do. Vegans are more responsible. Shai agrees. Just think, being, a, just think, being responsible for farm animals is what differentiates carnists from vegans. A carnist does not feel responsible for them, he doesn't care. At the same time, it is important to emphasize that while animals were still taken care of, even as families changed and human children were born, the physical and symbolic place of the animals within the household was reconfigured, similar to what was found with regards to non-vegan families. The animals not only received less attention and care, but their flexible role was evident and feelings of love toward them lessened, as well as their status in the hierarchical order within the family. He knows his position changed somewhat, past tells of his cat, and Lee illustrates. There is now a hierarchy in our home, and the cats are at the bottom of it. The notion of hierarchy exemplifies the complexities that arise as our vegan interlocutors attempt to delineate their conceptualizations of multi-species relations in general, and in their household specifically. As with regards to other topics, our interviewees fluctuated in the ways they construct or blur human-animal boundaries. All of them claim they aim to change current hierarchies that position animals as human property or tools in the way they perpetuate the use and abuse of animals and by humans. Yet, more than half nevertheless view animals as dependent childlike creature, creatures, words in need of human guardianship. The hierarchies constructed within the homes and families were much more uniform. Various statements made it clear that the shift did occur following the birth of the human child, and that this shift entailed the demotion of the animal within the familial hierarchy. The only one that continually challenged and blurred such definitions was Adi, who discussed the deceased dog as much more than a child. In fact, after his daughter was born, he continually made comparisons between the two. What difference do definitions make? He was my dog, he wasn't my child, and I loved him just as much. At the same time, Adi also knows that his statements do not adhere to cultural expectations, adhere to cultural expectations and norms, and state he is not proud of his feelings. Beyond the variations that came across in the interviews we conducted, we conclude that flexibility in the treatment of the animals and emotional attachments created with them does exist. This flexibility did not necessarily pertain to their personhood as was found in my previous research. Rather, the flexibility in the vegans' relationships with their animals was found in the emotional, specifically loving connections they formed with them. This love often decreased following changes in the family and in other cases faded away completely. However, this flexibility was not evident in feelings of compassion, responsibility, and obligation. These rigidly persisted and were firmly advocated by the overwhelming majority of our interlocutors. We offer that the seeming contradiction between the flexible hierarchical position of the non-human animal and the declining love towards them on the one hand, 
and the rigid empathy and obligational feelings towards them on the other can be explained by differentiating emotions and ideological sentiments. As Hochschild claims, there are links between feelings and between cultural ideas and structural arrangements. These links, affect, these links affect the ways emotions are managed. Vegans, on the one hand, attempt to alter cultural ideas and structural arrangements as they object to the habitual cultural use and consumption of animals. This is their ideology and it is internalized into their feeling rules. At the same time, the home, the familial setting, their everyday relations can make it less clear or obvious what principles guide such individual moments of emotion, emotion management. The interviewees articulated how everyday life brought with it complexities, such as living with non-vegan family members, both human and non-human, or non-human animals that are harder to connect or get along with. These created a gap between the declarative level and the procedural level, as emotions became messy, blurred, or troubled. Israeli vegans belong to a cultural setting that places an emphasis on human-animal boundaries and hierarchies, as well as the centrality of family. At the same time, they're part of a social movement that aims to alter and transform existing norms. Perhaps for this reason, we came across many fluctuating and conflicting statements, as vegans struggle to carve out a clear sense of identity from conflicting narratives and cultural expectations. While their loving emotions and complete incorporation of incorporation of animals into their lives are often contested, their commitment to the vegan ideology and empathy towards what they perceive as their charges remains stable. While adhering to a vegan ideology that strives to change basic is now, related, you have two minutes left. Thank okay. You. While adhering to a vegan ideology that strives to change basic Israeli cultural tenets regarding multi-species relations, the vegan narratives describes described, perhaps surprisingly, do not undermine the most basic tenet of all, that of hierarchy itself, one that is manifested in human authority and patronization. This was reflected in the interlocutor's expressed feelings of responsibility, obligation, and compassion towards the helplessness of the non-human animal. In conclusion, the data reveals that the vegans in this research and their attempts to deconstruct multi-species borders and gender creative and innovative narratives regarding the place their animals inhabit in their homes. At the same time, they continue to utilize existing social and emotional categories, such as parent-child relations, family, responsibility, and love. In this way, while ethical vegan parents in Israel try to change social hierarchies and norms regarding multi-species demarcations, they're never, nevertheless continually delineating them, although in multiple and varied ways. Thank you very much, Daphne and Limor, and thank you for all the wonderful and, and interesting lectures. Now we will move to the discussion part, which will, which will start with, the comment, with, with comments by Professor Leslie Irvin. Uh, Leslie Irvin is a professor of sociology and director of the Animals and Society Certificate Program at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's the author of several books, including My Dog Always Eats First, which examines home homeless people's relationship with the companion animals and feeling the arc, which focuses on animal welfare and disaster. Leslie has also studied animal shelter and abuse, representations of animals in popular culture, and the feminization of veterinary medicine. You can also find her articles in numerous prestige journals. Please, Professor Irvin, you are more than welcome to speak. Wait a minute. Hello. Let me unmute you. Oh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Shalom. My dog Louis says hello, always strategically timed. The wonderful papers today. Um, I want to begin by saying that topically, these three papers seem very different. First, we have a paper on animals in cities. Then we have one on emotions, desire, and its role in survival. And then we have one on families and veganism. But I, would, I see these papers as fitting together conceptually and methodologically, moving from the uh, macro level to the micro level. So uh, on the macro level, we have a discussion of urbanization 
um, on the what we sociologists might call the, the meso level, the, the connecting the micro and macro level, we have the paper from a more um, philosophical and humanistic perspective, connecting desire and survival. Uh, third, we have the micro level, the paper on families, looking at the intimate domestic uh, lives at, at, uh, from an everyday perspective. Consistent with the theme of reconsiderations of this panel, I, I want to make um, two points about all the papers, and then I have a question to start off our discussions. Uh, I have a question for each author. So first of all, all of these three papers question notions of boundaries and hierarchies. We have, um, as you all know, we have a socially constructed human animal boundary that uh, is enforced culturally uh, in many, many ways, both at the, the family level and at the government level and every level in between. We also have a, a series of hierarchies, what the sociologists Arnie Arluk and Clint Sanders referred to as the socio-zoologic scale. So in contrast to a, a taxonomic scale or a tree of life, they created a, or they established the notion of a socio-zoologic socio scale, which ranks animals according to their moral and social value for human beings. So of course we have human beings at the top and then we have those animals who uh, we love, who are, um, who we consider good, dogs, cats, horses, the large, you know, charismatic megafauna, they're up high. And then as we go down, we move to pests and vermin. And at the bottom of the sociozoologic scale are the animals that we can disregard and even exterminate by any means possible. So all three papers are at some level questioning these boundaries and this notion of a hierarchy. In the paper on cities, we, uh, it problematizes this boundary between nature and civilization. Uh, cities were established as spaces designated solely for human activity. And over time, uh, obvious animal presence in cities was uh, restricted and even eliminated or attempted to be eliminated. But um, as Anna points out, cities have always been multi-species places. Uh, we can't imagine some cities like Venice, for example, or New York without their enormous flocks of pigeons. And even today, um, wild animals are becoming um, quote unquote problems in cities. Uh, wild pigs, for example, um, are becoming problems in some cities, deer in some cities, coyotes. But in other cities, their presence is welcomed. In, in New York City, peregrine falcons have made homes in skyscrapers and they've been welcomed back. And New Yorkers are um, thrilled to see uh, them building nests and thriving um, in their city. So um, the, the, the paper on cities especially questions this, this this boundary that we've drawn between nature and civilization and shows how, how flexible and fluid it is using the example of companion dogs. The paper on emotions questions this boundary that was long in place between emotions and rationality and also the notion, the boundary between humans capable of emotions and animals uh, not capable of emotions. Um, in, in a moment, I'll get to another uh, um, difference, the paper of questions, but uh, drawing together the work of Mark Beckoff with the poet uh, uh, and the, the current Italian ethnographer and uh, <laughs> ethologist rather and veterinarian, I think is just a wonderful way to, to 
uh, show the multidimensional nature of emotions. The third paper questions the boundaries of the families. What, what is this thing called family? We, when we use the term family member, what are we including? And when we talk about something like veganism, where are we drawing that boundary? If you, um, in conversations about veganism, you often have vegans who will, they'll, they'll eliminate animal products up to a point, or they'll eliminate most animal products, but they'll eat honey, or they'll wear silk, or they'll keep leather if it's been in, around for a long time. So these are boundaries that are always, always being negotiated. And in terms of hierarchies, how is family status negotiated? We even had this one quote from uh, Leahy points out very clearly uses a term hierarchy and says, oh, the cats are now at the, at the bottom of the hierarchy. So all of these three papers playing with these um, frameworks of boundaries and hierarchies. Second, they all also play on a double meaning of concept within uh, their work. The, the notion of city, or the paper on cities plays with several concepts such as private and public and wildness. For example, the private realm we think of as you know, within the four doors of the house, but this, the, the leash, the concept of the leash extends that notion of privacy six feet or what, two meters. It, privacy ex is extended to the end of the leash or within the, the boundaries of the muzzle. And this is also uh, reflected in the notion that in most Western societies, animals are still considered the legal property, private property of their owners. So I can bring my dog out in public and use the leash to extend my line of property, my line of ownership to the end of the, the leash. Um, the paper on emotions plays extensively with no, the notion of the, 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 the term matter. And matter, as Cosetta, you point out, has this material origin. Matter is, we know what matter is, it's material, to have material form. But to matter as a, a verb is also to be of importance or to have significance. And to say something like, the heart is the matter, I think points out this um, double meaning. The heart is the matter because it has this capacity, but the heart is the matter because it also has significance. And by arguing that matter feels and thinks, I think you're also saying that matter matters. So matter is that material has significance. Uh, the paper on families, family has the term has always had various meanings. Once upon a time, we thought families consisted of two heterosexual adults and their what, 2.2 children, preferably also a boy and a girl, just like their parents. And gradually, we've allowed much more flexibility in what we consider a family. And the, to make matters more complicated, the term is also used colloquially. So people will say, oh, this, this company is just like a family or this department is just like a family. Or, or, and so we use it very casually, but those aren't people we would uh, necessarily give our lives for, or you know, we, we might throw some of them off the lifeboat <laughs> in contrast to, to blood family members. But this, this notion of, of the meaning of family that it can change so quickly and the notion of personhood uh, um, extending from Daphne's earlier paper that it can be so flexible that you can consider your animal uh, a virtual person. And then when this other quote unquote real person comes along, 
uh, that can certainly change. Uh, now, third, to the questions. Um, I, I've tried to make these as concise as possible so you can remember them and talk about them. For the paper on cities, I, 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 I'm on board with you all the way, and I love the work of the geographers, especially Jennifer Walsh and Jody Emmel, who talk about Zoopolis and talk about want, want to introduce ways. Oh, hello, Kitty. Um, who talk about ways that we should make cities more humane. Um, and I am wondering, in light of the fact that we are we've just dealt with a pandemic that's passed through a virus from an animal source. What do we do about, um, I'm thinking from a One Health perspective, if you're familiar with that, where it, rather than seeing human health and animal health, we see them, we see the connections. So what about what we would call public health? What about, um, threats to human health from animals in public spaces and threats to animal health from human presence in spaces. And I'll just go through the, the three questions and then we can uh, do whatever we want to do with them. On the, the emotions paper, the heart is the matter. One thing I've long thought about and read about and have reached no definitive conclusions about is, I, I, I certainly have accepted for a long time that animals, many, many, many species have emotional capacities. Um, some people would argue that we should draw a line at some point. We should define sentience as this. Um, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Um, do we draw a line? If we have to draw a line, if pushed, where would that line be? For the paper on families, I was wondering if any of your respondents uh, saw a contradiction in the commitment to veganism on one hand and keeping pets as companion animals on the other. Because for the most part, keeping a pet means that you have to kill or, or not personally kill, but you have to have some animals uh, available for your animals to consume for food. So you're being compassionate to some animals while you're condoning the death and consumption of others. And I wondered if any of the respondents um, had anything to say about this. So Shlomit, I, I hope I'm not Stepping Thank on you, your toes here, but <laughs> it's okay. Thank um, you, Leslie. We do we, we don't have a lot of time, so please, yeah. if you can start answering the questions, uh, Mana, please. Thank you very much for the question and for the wonderful summary. And um, I'm just shortly repeating it about the pandemic virus. How we should change this um, in regards to a one health perspective or a public health perspective. And I'm thinking one point I try to make is that it's not just about unbinding the differences and separating it, but we also have to sometimes create new boundaries. In the end, we have to concentrate on creating safe spaces for both. And it doesn't necessarily mean just letting the city run wild, so to say, because that is not longer possible. For this, we have the uh, model of a domestication of responsibility. Animals have become dependent on us. We have created certain architectural structures and now we have to work with them, around them and possibly adapt them to make it possible to have safe encounters. We can, of course, not have a horde of pigeons in a hospital. That's uh, not in anyone's idea, but we have to find a way to where make room for pigeons, for example, how many pigeons, how to treat our animals. And I think the closer we get to them, the more we know about problems and the sooner we anticipate them, differently than if we just see them as a symbol of disruptiveness and possible risks to us, then we won't look close enough and we won't anticipate problems and notice them quite as early on. What a Thank great you, answer. Anna. Thank you. Cosetta? Can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for your really flattering remarks and for the beautiful synthesis you've made of our papers. 
as to your question, it's an extremely difficult question to answer in the sense that how do we define um, emotions of beings that um, uh, actually certainly display behaviors which we uh, think we recognize and in certain cases we have uh, strong uh, evidence uh, to argue that they are uh, identical or let's say very similar to ours but how do we define emotions of being and which are further away from us so while on the one hand we may uh, say that um, uh, mammals for example certainly share a lot of emotions with us uh, well um, it's difficult if you ask me about an insect uh, we mentioned um, for example spiders yesterday how do we know about spiders emotions there i would be more inclined to draw a line but uh, because it's the environment which shapes our emotions, we have, I think, to look at animals, uh, at the different animals uh, uh, in their own um, characteristics, uh, because it's the environment which influences their emotions and their emotions which modifies their environment. So uh, it's a difficult, extremely difficult question to answer. I don't think I'm in a position to, to say that where, where rather than if we need to draw a line. Thank you, Cosetta. Limor and Daphna, please. One last minute. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna make it short. We, we did have respondents talking about the, this innate conflict between wanting to care for the animals and also the problematics that arise when having pets. Um, a lot of them, well, all of them were rescue animals. So from that perspective, they felt that they were helping a situation that was already bad and they were trying to just do the best they can within that situation. They did address the fact that cats, for example, cannot be given vegan food because that is hazardous for their health and they're also um, a hunting species. Uh, so that was definitely something that they did consider and that was even harder for them than just the situation of having a pet, but definitely something that did come up in the conversations. Okay. So if there's anybody who wants to ask a question or make a comment, please. Since I am unmuted, can I be first? <laughs> Um, I would love to ask Anna, um, I'm actually working on a very similar project here in Israel, uh, not uh, about cities, but about smaller communities. But I've been working on really a lot of these same themes that you've been talking about and how um, th there's an attempt to manage the animalness within the human space. So when animals are in the homes and they're quiet and their excretions are controlled, that's okay. But once they're not, not controlled, if they're out without a leash, if they leave their excretions behind, if they're barking uh, or any other, and, and that's when I'm talking about dogs, but also other animals, any uh, um, sense that humanness is being in some way um, um, penetrated and threatened, uh, it was really unwelcome. So at least in Israel, there was a, a, a heated debate about how to control these things. I actually take this uh, one step further and I, and I show how it's similar to human others uh, in Israel. And that becomes a political issue, but when human others enter the community in very similar ways, the boundaries are dem demarcated. We don't want their trash. We don't want their noise and uh, we don't want them to be roaming unsupervised. But that's of course something a little bit different. But when you talk about post-human city, at least where I did this research, I didn't feel that that was something that was welcome. And I was wondering, um, I, as far as I understand, I'm not sure what your methodology was, but if you're getting a sense that in other places it is, places it is something that would be welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, it sounds like very interesting research. I would love to read a little bit more about this later on. Maybe you can send me a paper. Um, 
Unfortunately, I think the question of if it's welcome is not just uh, bound to one region. I experienced the same in Germany. As soon as, of course, you leave the house, then you have different kinds of reactions from people. And it often is a little bit more extreme in cities than on the countryside. There is a lot more accepted from the animal, for example, from dogs being dogs in the countryside, whereas if you imagine a city, as you said, barking is already a problem. And I did a few um, one point which I find it interesting with dogs is because they are a semi-public animal and they actually go out with the humans, and their responsibility plays a much bigger role. So you can actually talk to a responsible person. Otherwise, if you're angry at a cat, it will go off or not. You can be, of course, uh, annoyed by this or not. But with a, with a human, there's actually a conflict happening and you have a person to talk to about this. And um, when I was interviewing some dog trainers in, in clubs and trainings, I was interested that they said most people don't come to the training for the dog, but actually for the reception of the dog. So they have issues, they have problems with neighbors, they need to fit in maybe landlords, maybe certain expectation, and it has to fit that one. And they literally, when I talked to them about the people there as well, they're like, yeah, you know, it just has to work out like this. And I'm not always liking it, but if I leave my home at home, he's allowed to do this or that, but in the public has to follow certain rules. And it is what I mentioned shortly in my talk as well. Owners change their behavior towards the animals often as well. Maybe a little bit like in your study with the vegans, you leave the house and suddenly, whereas before it, it was petted and it was cute, even talk to the dog maybe, shared a lot of attention with it, you concentrate a bit more of the social inhibitions. It depends a little bit on the people's characters. So the more aware you are of your surroundings, and the more you often um, tend to, well, um, transfer this to the expectation onto your animal. Thank you very much, Anna. So we will meet here again in 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice break.